Good afternoon, everyone, and um, let me welcome you all to this uh, afternoon keynote session. Uh, my name is Marcel Fenez, and I'm the global leader of PricewaterhouseCoopers Entertainment and Media Practice. I'm half French, I'm half English, and it's going to be my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to a full-blooded Frenchman and to a full-blooded Englishman, which just goes to show that I guess Entente Cordiale is alive and well. But much more importantly, let me give you the latest score from the Ryder Cup. Europe, 13 and a half. USA, 13 and a half. One match to play, three holes to play. Europe, a one up. So, I guess in around about 15, 20 minutes, someone better uh, tell me the actual result and I'll try to relay it all to you. Um, but with that, let me uh, move into this afternoon's session. Um, I'm going to be joined, as I say, by two CEOs who are going to be talking about um, the impact of, of big industry trends on their organizations. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to give a little bit of context for those comments. And I want to do that by reference to the PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Entertainment and Media Outlook, um, and really focusing a little bit on some numbers, but also on some important key drivers of change. Um, let me start off my comments, though, by looking back a little bit to 2009. 2009 uh, really was a watershed year. Obviously, it had a number of impacts on our industry. The first thing, obviously, is we saw ad revenues drop around about 12% worldwide. Um, but we also saw a number of, I think, very important trends on the consumer side. The fact that people had less money to spend really has accelerated the pace of their migration to digital options. I don't think anyone can be surprised by that. If you've got less money to spend, you're going to find a cheaper way or a free way or an illegally free way of accessing the content. And we began to see the impact on, of that migration on segments like DVDs, which really did, uh, sales really did drop off significantly in 2009. And we even saw people begin to turn off their pay TV subscriptions in some markets. So important to recognize that those changes are going to be permanent and to have actually a longer term impact. Um, so as we turn to uh, the forecast period, which we talk about as being five years, what I want to do is to share with you some numbers which really are very relevant uh, to the television industry. So let's start off by looking at what we see happening in terms of ad spending. Now, against the context of um, what we see as a rebound in ad spending over the next five years, around about 4, four to 5 percent on a compound basis, um, let's look about how the, the pie uh, and what TV's share of that pie uh, looks like over the five-year period. And you can see from this, if the clicker works, there we go. You can see that um, over the five-year period, TV, which is around about uh, 35, 36 uh, percent today, uh, actually will increase its share of ad spending to around about 37 percent. Now, that clearly, so those people who have talked about the demise of television, I think you can tell from that that certainly we're a believer that that is absolutely not the case, particularly over the forecast period. Um, what this pie does, however, indicate is that obviously the online portion, the digital portion of advertising, uh, is going to increase, in fact, increasing from 15 to 21%, largely at the expense of your colleagues in print. So largely a positive story. In fact, obviously, the first six months of this year, we've seen some markets actually showing growth rates way in excess of that. But I think we need to be cautious when we're looking at just a, a six-month period particularly when we're comparing it with such a lousy uh, you know, comparative period in 2009. Um, so if we then move on and look at, so that's a relatively bright picture, I think, from an advertising viewpoint. If we go and look on uh, to the subscription side, you'll see that in terms of overall growth rates and when we compare um, pay television uh, with other forms of entertainment and media, you can see from this that in terms of overall growth rates, television subscriptions in terms of growth is second only to video games in terms of uh, uh, expansion of revenues. So again, a very positive story. If we look at how that pans out region by region, I don't think any real surprise there. Uh, Asia in particular uh, growing the quickest, around about 12% uh, compound over each of the five years. 
followed by uh, some of the emerging markets in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, and then um, Latin America and the Middle East, where actually I've, I've just come from yesterday. Um, so you can see some positive stories, again, within the context of paid television. A lot of that is driven actually by a greater number of people actually having access to services. So that could be as a result of IPTV rollouts in, in some parts of the world. It could be the launch of DTH services. Um, so depending on which market you're, you're looking at, um, you see an increase in penetration of pay TV services. Now that's all very well, and that's what the numbers show. Um, but what's the story behind those numbers? Uh, and what I would like to share with you now um, is just a, a short video um, which uh, looks at the view of the consumer. Every year when we do our, uh, uh, our annual outlook, we talk to consumers about how they are using uh, media and how they are interacting with media. This year we focus very much on families because we wanted to see whether there's any generational differences um, between how different members of the family are engaging with media. So what I'm going to do now is play a video um, and then we'll just analyze some of the key themes afterwards. So, can we play the video, please? grands-parents, ils seraient complètement largués par le monde dans lequel on vit aujourd'hui. Il y a des écrans de partout. En 10 ans, il y a eu une révolution à ce niveau-là. Je check the weather, I take photos, I tweet, I blog, I do Google searches. It's pretty much my life. to the internet for, um, for television, which is why I'm going to get rid of my DVR. Sem dúvida que a internet virou uma opção melhor agora, de, seja de baixar vídeo, filme ou até mesmo um jornal. Ima sugu ni ongaku ga hoshiku natta toki toka wa keitai de download shita ni shimasu. Keitai no game wo download shite tama ni tsukatte. I found some, uh, some internet sites where you can watch uh, movies, the stream. Movies and television shows online. Yeah. I'm willing to pay a lot more for 3D movies. I can actually watch shows on mobile before, without missing it, as in ir ir irrespective of where, wherever I am or whatever place I am in. Ever the gasp do the disc, physical or music internet. Since the change in the economy, I've had to really tighten my belt. I used to spend a fortune on glossy magazines. Now I just go online. I don't get to keep the copy, but everything's there at your fingertips. I actually probably spend more time consuming media since the economy's gone down because going out is costly. When the recession ends, I'll probably be buying more music, um, uh, probably more movies. I'm going to get a Blu-ray player because lots of the DVDs now are coming out on Blu-ray. They're more expensive, but the quality is much better. So the Blu-ray player is also the PlayStation. I'm really ready to invest in the screens 3D or to change my portable vers la 3D. La qualité, c'est vraiment un truc, euh, c'est pas en option. Eu assistiria a comerciais em troca de um conteúdo gratuito. Se eu receber conteúdo por free, eu não me importo em assistir alguns comerciais. Então, não é um grande problema para mim assistir comerciais. Na verdade, isso pode ser divertido também. Eu gosto de ver 
Acho que essa customização uh, só tem, só tem a ajudar. Tanto é, é melhor para o cliente e é melhor para o anunciante. Eu gostaria de compartilhar com meu nome, minha família family background, onde eu estou e o que tipo de família eu gosto. E eu gostaria de eles dizerem onde o produto é realmente disponível para mim. And where is it? It's nearest to me. I probably would be willing to give away information about myself in order for people to target advertising towards me because there's nothing worse than watching adverts that you're not really interested in at all. So, um, as that video said, there is no place to hide um, from digital transformation. Um, in fact, worse than that, um, that has some significant impact on the entire value chain. If you think about it, there's always someone out there right now who's trying to eat your lunch. And so the big question is, where do, where do we all fit in this new value chain? I think there are three key challenges that I just want to address, and it, it really comes out of some of those comments and others that we've heard from consumers. The first, of all, the first one, and this is becoming really clear this year, is the fact that the mobile story, which we've been talking about for, I don't know, six, seven years, is becoming a reality. Um, if you think about it, we have been talking about you know, mobile TV, et cetera, et cetera. But if we look up till now, really, share of mobile advertising. Mobile advertising is around about 2 billion out of 450 billion. Um, mobile revenues, other than music, are really nothing. Um, so why are we so keen on mobility this year? The reason is because of the device revolution. The consumer, all of us here, um, and all of the consumers are out there, are absolutely fixated right now by their device. It may have an eye at the front of it, or it could just be a smartphone, an e-reader, or whatever but they're absolutely obsessed by their device. Now, the combination of a device that can carry rich content and which is, is and on which the consumer is definitely becoming more and more loyal to, and the fact that many governments around the world are investing in next generation networks, means that that mobile story is going to become a reality. Importantly, also, what the consumer has been saying to us is, I'm loyal to my device, but actually, I don't really care about my service provider. Now, that's what they're saying to us right now. That may change, but I think it's important consideration. The second thing that the consumer is saying to us well and truly is content really matters. And they're talking, though, about the underlying content. They're talking less, interestingly, about channels. Obviously, because at the end of the day, it's all about good programming and what device am I watching that programming on. The second thing that's becoming very clear is that the internet experience is just the experience and really is embracing all type of media. Um, now, to give you an example, and, and I'll use a kind of an extreme example because I think it proves the point best. If you think of books, now to me, reading a book is kind of my most basic experience, right? But when I didn't understand a word in a, in a, in a sentence, what did you used to do? At least this is me. I used to read around it and I'd try to get the meaning of the word, right? Now, if I'm reading a, a book on my e-reader, what do I do when I don't understand a word? I click on the word, takes me into a dictionary, and I know what it means. So that click experience is, and that internet experience is now embracing all types of uh, uh, media. And also, very importantly, is that the immediacy issue is becoming really apparent. People are getting tired. You know that delay when you boot up? So why do you want to boot up when you're going to be using your mobile device and it's always on, right? And I'm sure if someone was on um, line right now, they could tell me if Europe had finally won or not. Um, going, therefore, to the sort of third key challenge, um, and this is really, I think, a clear theme that we've seen this year, is how consumers are finally telling us what they might pay for. Now, by and large, if it's just content, they will try to find it cheap and free. But there are certain things that they are saying that they will pay for. Three very important things. First of all, quality. 
There was a, a young lady we interviewed recently who uh, said to us she, she used to uh, use LimeWire uh, to download music, um, which she didn't pay for. But LimeWire gave her PC, her laptop, a virus. So now she pays for music through iTunes. Um, we've seen people talk to us constantly about quality matters. The second thing they're talking to us about is obviously convenience, watching something in the convenience of your own home, or potentially watching something out of home on a mobile device. That's differentiating. And the final thing, and the one that actually excites me more, is around how one can enrich content into an even more enduring experience. And again, let's look at the music industry. The music industry that we know has been in decline for a number of years, one aspect that's been growing is live performances, going to gigs. Now, I don't know whether any of you have been to a gig recently, but they tend to be pretty expensive, in my opinion, anyway. Um, and yet, isn't it interesting how people are prepared to pay quite a lot of money to go to a gig, but then they won't pay for music? How's, how's that work? So what are they paying for? They're paying for an enriched experience. And I think these three uh, themes really dominate um, when we consider where do we all play in this value chain. But there's another important aspect, I think, that we all need to consider, uh, and certainly a question I'm going to be putting to our two CEOs, is what are the important things you need to get right um, from an industry viewpoint? We kind of highlight seven of them, and I'm not going to go through all of these in, in detail. Perhaps we can explain, explore some of them when we talk to our CEOs. But a couple of them here, I think, are really important. The word flexibility is absolutely critical. That's at the top left there. Another thing that I think is really critical today is the speed of decision making and the ability to experiment. Now, you could be using these seven factors almost as like a scorecard, right? How are you, how does your organization fare uh, in a number of these areas? It's an, interesting exper it's an interesting experiment. I definitely would say that if you look at the world's most successful companies, I reckon they score pretty highly on strategic flexibility, speed of decision making, and just the ability and a, a willingness to experiment. A couple of other things on here that I think are kind of interesting. Uh, bottom, bottom right, as you're looking at it there, um, the importance to develop strong capabilities in partnering. So we're not talking so much about M&A anymore. What we're talking about is how do you partner with people who are going to ac help you access those new revenue streams, maybe to deliver a better experience, or alternatively, maybe he's going to share some of the risks with you. So maybe there are certain things you don't need to compete on anymore. You know, you keep compete on key great content, but maybe there's some other aspects of your business that you don't need to compete on. And therefore, this ability to partner uh, becomes extremely important. And then the final one, which I am sure is at the heart of uh, uh, all of our conversations, is talent management. At the end of the day, we are an industry whose asset is talent. Um, I, I believe that there is so much hidden talent in organizations, and the question is, is how do we bring that to the fore? And it reminds me of a, of a, um, a young lady who is in an audience. I was giving a presentation once to some journalists, and this young lady said, I was talking about change and how the industry was changing. And she put her hand up and she said, excuse me, sir, does my boss understand what you're saying? This is very interesting. And I thought a minute, you know, what it's like when you've got journalists in the room and you think, God, what newspaper is she from? Got to be a bit careful. I said, who do you mean? She said, the CEO. Does he get it? So I thought, that's interesting. And I, of course, said, yes, I deal with a lot of CEOs. I'm going to be talking to two of them in a minute. And I say, of course they get it. Well, that's an interesting thing, because if the person at the top of the organization gets it, and of course the youngsters get it, because there's nothing to get, the interesting bit is the bit in the middle. And in terms of analyze, analyzing people, it's very interesting because if you look at organizations, you can actually suss most people out in two ways. All of us either will or we won't do something, or we can or we can't do something. Those people who will and can, well, they're pretty high flyers. Those people who won't and can't, well, I think we know what happens to them. And then we have two other interesting categories. Those people who will, but just don't have the skills, they can't. What's the solution for them? Maybe there's some skills training that one can put in. But the real interesting characters are those people who have the ability, they can, but they won't. And if you think of the power of organizations and untapped power, an untapped resource, 
I think that's the most interesting um, group, often to do with improving metrics and improving alignment, but a very interesting group of individuals um, to help uh, exploit um, this need for a search of, for position in the digital value chain. And I guess with that, and, and having given a few thoughts there by way, of, um, by way of introduction and by way of context, what I'd now like to do is to introduce you to the first of our CEOs. Um, the first CEO that um, it's my pleasure to be joined by, actually by satellite, um, is Nance Paolini. Um, Nance, unfortunately, couldn't be uh, with us here. He had intended to be, um, but he has, at, uh, with great effort, is joining us from um, the Paris studios of TF1, where he is CEO. Um, and I hope, technology willing, he is there to uh, give us some thoughts uh, on some of these key issues. Nance, are you there? Come in Paris. This is going well, I say, but I don't know whether it will. Hello, Nantes. Hello. Merci d'abord. Merci de votre invitation. Je suis absolument désolé de. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry not to be with you here, but there are uh, circumstances which prevent me from being here. I wanted to be with you, however. Uh, but this is kind of a, a fantasy come true for me. Here I am sitting uh, on the seat of the news presenter for the, be the most watched uh, news program in France. So this is something I've always wanted to do. So because of this uh, situation, I can be in this particular hot seat. I wanted to come back on some of the things which you've talked about, notably quality, uh, comfort, and enriching content. I think in this area, uh, Players like ourselves have a lot of trump cards for the future. If I take the look at uh, Europe TF1, our ambition is a major ambition to inform, to entertain, to move, and to federate as many members of the audience as possible on the television. That's our main goal. The second goal is to be able to create a link, an interactive and lasting link uh, of closeness with feedback, with questions and answers which might come from our um, our, our viewers through television, digital television. The TF1 group has made a lot of progress. I would first of all like to give you four observations. On the first slide that you're going to be able to see, here it is, our first slide. The first observation, which may not be immediately obvious, is that since the beginning of this year, French television is the uh, media which has had the most investments of all media. It is the most popular media. And in the evening, there are 25 million viewers on average who come to watch French television. And a lot of them watch TF1. So what are the uh, interesting elements? As you can see in France, uh, consumption of television continues to increase. Uh, uh, three minutes, 26 more than last year. And those over 25 who look at internet a lot, let us remember that on average, this group uh, watch four times more television than internet. That means that they are uh, multitasking, multimedia, and this generation watches as much television as it does other media, new media. Our third observation, we were talking earlier on about quality. High definition has... Um, enhanced traditional television viewing. And I would say that the World Cup for football, which was very successful all around the planet this summer, well, that was the first 100% digital high definition World Cup. And it was accessible with TF1 and on all of our channels, including big screens, small screens, and uh, screens in other, group, other members of the group. So. The, all of the spectators were forced, were obliged to watch uh, this high-density high experience. The fourth uh, observation is another very interesting one, showing to the degree to which the television set is a key feature of a French household. There are over 30 million television sets were screened, in, were sold in four years. They're better performing, better quality, and as we can see, um, television and huge uh, extravaganzas have a, a good future ahead of them. 
There are other medias which relay these experiences, which is why the 360 experience is at the heart of the TF1 group strategy. And from this point of view, we are trying to be groundbreakers and to be as, to, and to meet the needs of the different consumers you were talking about earlier on. As you can see, uh, we give we do direct um, programs, live programs, shared programs, enhanced programs, non-linear uh, programs. Of course, as far as the live shows are concerned, TF1 is uh, the leading channel in Europe. For uh, non-linear, we are on pay TV, we are on the web, obviously, on mobile, and also we play a role in uh, the sharing on social networks. But we have a web channel called What? in partnership with Facebook and uh, Twitter. It's important to see that today consumers are multitaskers and they are in a situation where they can watch the television and also add their comments on a social network, on another media. And the partnerships that we have set up with Facebook and with Twitter have made that quite operational. And finally, for enhancement, there's a lot of work which we've done here to get onto digital media with enriched content. You can't simply uh, offer catch-ups. You have also uh, a round of program to give uh, uh, brand new things, innovations, different types of uh, content which can correspond to the taste of this or that consumer. And that is why today we don't design a program without declining it for other media. It has to be a multimedia project. That's something we work on in TF1 every day and that for, for several months now. We have uh, set up a transversal organization which enables us to be flexible, proactive, reactive, so that every time when we have a program we can add as, uh, as much enhanced program as possible to generate a secondary audience at any time of the day, whether it's on a mobile or a pay TV channel or on a computer. And I would say that today we have collective experience on this uh, on the big screens in French households today, moving on to a personal experience where we can go even further in uh, the program according to the different tastes of the viewers without sharing it with the rest of the family, with the other members of the family. Today we've uh, set up for all of our different channels and particularly for TF1, we've set up mirror websites like the new site or tf1.fr. There are alternative sites which enable the consumers to dialogue, to discuss so that we can meet their needs, we can uh, enhance the, the content. We, uh, and this involves um, World Cup programs to, to reality TV to create new experiences, never linking the, never breaking the link with our viewers and giving them a constant opportunity to observe our content from this point of view. If we take a look at catch-ups, and this is going to be the subject of my third slide, which you can now see, you will see that we have broken viewing records. Catch-up in France is a new phenomenon. And you can see that in every field, whether it's the news or American television series or French fiction, French drama, whether it's World Cup or, or reality TV, all of these different programs are breaking viewing records on the web. And if we were to sum it all up, from January to August 2010, you can see that there are 620 million catch-ups were watched or broadcast by TF1. And this, for this first part of the year, is a, a much higher score than uh, in previous years. So that means that within the space of a few months, we have high performance levels, which we would have to, it would have taken us a whole year to um, uh, achieve in previous year. If you look at how our viewers use their programs, each screen has its own function. TV is for sharing with the family. Uh, a computer is everyone for themselves. And then the mobile is when you're out and about moving around. You don't want to miss the news or an event. And it's up to us, a huge network, to make sure that our content is adapted to each individual and to each of these different uses, to each of these devices to enable the television viewer, the internet viewer, the mobile user to be with us whenever they want to. And that is uh, a, a job 
which we have moved forward with in 2009-2010. And today, if we were talk talking about monetizing the services, then uh, we have a uh, multimedia uh, management on these different vectors which I've been talking about, and we can make money from the content and consumption of this content. And at one time, it was said that uh, TF1 had uh, missed out on the uh, internet uh, and this is untrue, as you will see in this fourth side, you will see that today TF1 is in a very singular position in its market since it is the top media group on the internet with very impressive figures since it's almost 17 uh, million uh, individual hits. And you can see whether on TF1.fr or rubber the blog, which is the number one in uh, France, and the other TF1, we can see you can see that uh, we are in very enviable position. And I would say, in conclusion, before answering your questions after this uh, brief presentation, I would like to say that uh, I believe very strongly that uh, we are on the right track. First, because uh, technology, we can see that high definition and tomorrow 3D make uh, television uh, a very compelling form of entertainment. Today we can develop content in a wide range of forms, whether it's the content itself or its derivatives or what uh, you could not see on the main screen. And today it is possible, whether in the home, on a PC, on a mobile device, uh, uh, when you're um, uh, moving around. And this is quite possible. The second element that makes put, makes me trust the future is that today we know how to organize uh, the uh, rebound uh, between uh, these different uh, media, this is a virtuous cycle that has become a reality, as is a reality, the creation of uh, the uh, value of the uh, 360 uh, system on TF1. This helps us keep uh, good uh, audience uh, ratings. Uh, we have stronger ties with our competition, despite the very strong uh, with our, um, our viewers despite the very strong competition. It also helps us keep closer and dialogue truly and better understand what the uh, viewers expect from us. In short, I would say that the evolution the evolution of uh, consumption, forms of consumption, is favorable to us. And uh, TF1 and other comparable organizations are in the field and we're ready for growth. And it is for us to explore all the possibilities and uh, offer the best possible products to have the maximum success. And uh, uh, we have perhaps not always been so. With a the networks, we have to be aware of uh, expectations around us to anticipate new uses, to adapt to for the uh, uh, in the interest of uh, our viewers, uh, web users, and uh, advertisers on whom we depend. And this is what I wanted to say about uh, TF1 strategy, which uh, simply uh, is in response to uh, what you yourself uh, presented. So, Nance, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and thank you in particular for picking up on some of those themes of experience and quality uh, and convenience. Um, if it's okay, I would just like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, I, I mentioned, obviously, the recovery in advertising markets around the world. Now, in Europe, actually, that recovery has not been as robust as in other parts of the world, but TFA in the first half of this year has really um, reported some very strong growth. Is that growth sustainable? Of course, that's what I would like uh, more than anything else. Uh, quite seriously, the first half of the year was one of uh, a uh, rebound in advertising for television in particular and for TF1 even more. And uh, there are several phenomena in play. First, uh, the uh, space available was considerable. In 2009, we had a terrible crisis since uh, the offer was greater uh, dem uh, than uh, demand. And uh, this year, uh, the advertisers rediscovered the fact that the f first most main mass and most efficient mass media was uh, television, and uh, TF1 was particularly well placed in this area. There was uh, more available space, 
and the demand increased. And I should say that advertisers uh, returned uh, and so uh, the demand was in balance or even greater than offer. And so well, the results were quite favorable because everybody knows that 2009 was catastrophic all over Europe and in France for the second half of the year. The summer was good. The autumn is not perhaps less not as indecisive, but at the end of 2009, we had ended the year very well. Uh, this uh, we hope to be able to do as well this year. What I could say more generally is that indeed we also adapted to the new situation. There is more competition in the French uh, market and 93% of French homes have more access to more than 19 channels. So there is even more competition. From this standpoint, we've had to adapt our commercial offer with the more original segmentation, in particular with the different pricing between the day and night, investing a great deal on the uh, prime time and the evenings and peak times to be able to offer advertisers uh, the best uh, conditions uh, of exposure. I think things went quite well. And I would say that today TF1 is in a good position to be able, I hope, to have more value in coming months. Thank you, Nance. Um, let's just, just take a, a slightly different track. Um, in my presentation, I highlighted the importance of strategic flexibility. And I know that that has been a core of your strategy for the last two years. Um, but how has that worked in practice? Quite honestly, that was not the easiest part. When a leader domina has dominated the market for so many years, it is difficult to uh, uh, act as a challenger. Challengers must be uh, act quickly, more innovatively, faster than others. And it is true than as, that as large a structure as TF1, from that standpoint, wasn't really in the best position. So we had several phases uh, in uh, finding the right path, getting back to the right path, we focused on reorganizing the uh, company to uh, be able to work faster, to be able to work in a more cross-cutting way, to be sure that everyone understood that most of the functions were interdependent and that in this approach of new media, in this 360, it was essential for all the components of the company to work truly in a perfectly coordinated way, in perfect cooperation. A second orientation was a renewal of programming a certain number of concepts that were getting old and staff to a new generation arrived uh, in TF1 in the first months. It was not that easy because this new generation had to find, uh, have enough assurance. And uh, I think that today we can see that the team is working very well and we have reinstated much more flexible ways of working and that are much closer much more constructive, and this helps us work faster in making decisions. And of course, one of the important ideas was to uh, talk about the business model, uh, revise the business model for TF1. And one idea was to see how we could improve uh, management of the company. It has become a true corporate project with all co-workers, regardless of their professions. Uh, and this work on management uh, concerned uh, uh, standard uh, management, which is the easiest, easiest perhaps, although everyone here knows uh, every, that uh, it's not all that simple, but we succeeded. And so this helped us save uh, several uh, tens of millions of euros. but. This was also a matter of uh, working on the contracts and uh, the uh, scheduling. And this can be very complex with our partners, uh, producers, uh, the athletic federations. And everyone understood that it was in our common interest to have maximum flexibility with certain production contracts to introduce audience clauses so that uh, we could change programs as soon as we felt 
that uh, it no longer really met expectations. And I would say that in other situations, we were extremely pragmatic. This was true when we renegotiated uh, uh, contracts for sports with various uh, federations on different levels for football, for example. And we found this was much better for the balance of the contracts. And this pragmatism also entailed redefining with uh, the productions of drama, which is, of course, one of the pillars of uh, TF1's editorial line, defined there again a uh, more appropriate business model. So if you put together all the work we did on the processes, day-to-day uh, -day management, uh, and this 360 with all the uh, hierarchy and staff and this uh, uh, questioning and optimization uh, and negotiation of contracts to uh, find maximum agility that is obvious in our capacity within a few months to meet once again with once again with remarkable success on the internet and uh, you talked of the term it's very important of partnership. We set up partnerships, and I want to mention two or three of them. The first is with UGC, which, as you know, is one of the main French producers and distributors. Today, we partner with UGC to produce and distribute films and sell them worldwide. This is an intelligent, uh, intelligent way of sharing risk, and it's also an opportunity to combine our talents for maximum success. This is a first type of partnership. Another is with Samsung, which is the French and even worldwide leader in television sets. And with Samsung, we work with we have a partnership so that today the uh, interactive applications of TF1 are available on Samsung televisions. And we also have uh, a uh, partnership with La Française du Jour for uh, gaming. And this the major uh, partner with whom we learn a great deal and we can have uh, great ambitions. And so we have to be uh, flexible enough, concentrate on management, and uh, be as mobile as possible with respect to programming, coordinate uh, everyone's efforts, and not forget partnerships for the purpose of uh, satisfying the expectations of our different audiences and users. It's uh, been a pleasure talking to you. I wish I could ask you some more questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. Let me just say how great you look in the studio there. Um, so, you know, if, if you give up your daytime job, I'm sure you have another career ahead of you. So, Nantes, thank you very much, and please uh, uh, join me in thanking him for uh, joining us. Thank you so much, and uh, look forward to seeing um, okay. you again soon. So, um, uh, having listened to, to Nance and uh, uh, hearing him share the experience from TF1, uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to the CEO of BBC Worldwide for an Englishman's view of some of these major trends. So please join me in welcoming on stage John Smith. Hey, Melissa. Welcome, John. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. It's always great to come to MIPCOM and meet uh, so many brilliant and increasingly young and, to be honest, a little bit wacky people from across the TV industry. Thank you very much. Um, you know, these days, the media landscape is getting more and more crowded. It's getting more and more competitive. And for a distributor like BBC Worldwide, if we don't adapt to the kind of conditions, the changed circumstances that Marcel's just been talking about, then we'll be fast overtaken by somebody who does. So thank you very much indeed, Marcel, for those insights. Uh, as soon as we're done here, I'm going to get this report to all my managers all over the world, and hopefully we can learn from it and work out what the hell to do. Let me start, please, by giving a brief introduction of BBC Worldwide. For those who aren't familiar with us, here's a little VT which tells you a little bit about what we do. No. 
So thank you. Um, so we now sell TV programs from a catalogue of 50,000 hours uh, to more than 200 territories across the world. And our revenues from this make us the biggest TV distributor outside of Hollywood. We offer quality and distinctive, mainly British, television content to millions of fans. And this year I'm really rather excited to be presenting some pretty top-notch British shows like Come Fly With Me, uh, uh, Human Planet, Luther, Sherlock, and a whole load of others, just naming a few from a massive lineup. We've got um, offices in 24 different cities around the world, and as well as being a distributor, our own bouquet of TV channels now reaches more than 320 million homes all over the world. In the last few years, our revenues have grown from under a billion dollars in 2004 to nearly two billion dollars last year, and our profits last year hit a record number for us, $230 million, up 14% on the previous year. Now, the core of the business remains the TV catalogue, and growth will always come from expanding that. Increasingly, though, much of our expansion has come from four new themes, which I'd like to summarise in the next 10 minutes. Firstly, getting, content, uh, getting into content production ourselves. Secondly, expansion in specific countries. Thirdly, developing new businesses online and on mobile. And finally, building global brands. And let me whiz through each of those four themes. Firstly, making our own production. Since um, about 80% of TV viewing in all countries of the world is of programs made locally within, country, within each country, it seemed a natural step a few years ago for us to start to become a local producer of our own shows as well as being a distributor of others. We started with a format, a single format, Dancing with the Stars. And if anyone is unsure about the importance of formats, Pact today has published in the UK its UK TV export survey, which states that in 2009, the growth rate for sales of formats was more than double that of the growth rate of finished programs. Indeed, UK formats, the exports of UK formats, grew a whopping 25% last year alone. Now for us, Dancing with the Stars is a cracker. Here's a clip from the latest season of the show in the United States. So who would have thought four years ago that a programme on ballroom dancing, of all things, would become, according to the Guinness Book of Records, the most successful entertainment series in the world? The format's now been made into 35 local versions, and the majority of countries, in each of them, it's been a prime-time hit show. That clip was from the 11th season for ABC in the States, it just uh, launched a few weeks ago, and the first night achieved an audience of 21 million, with a 13% share, it beat its nearest competitor on CBS by two and a half million viewers. And this is a show in its 11th season. Producing this format locally in markets as diverse as India, Australia, and the US gives us three clear benefits. First, we get better financial returns through production fees and rating bonuses. Second, we're able to hold on to all the ancillary rights. And third, we can include the local versions of the show in our distribution catalogue and then sell it around the world. So we really like formats and we'd like to do more of it and we've set up production offices in various countries to do it. And on top of that, we've also taken minority stakes in independent TV production companies. The idea here is it allows us to seed corn smaller and start-up companies to develop great new programming and it saves 
the Indy from being swallowed up into a, big, a bigger production house. And the investments we've made have helped us produce award-winning programs such as the BAFTA-winning dramas, Wallander, from Left Bank, and Misfits from Clerkenwell, and innovative shows like Being Erica, the award-winning comedy series made by Temple Street, our indie company in Canada. That show, since becoming a success for CBC in Canada, we've now sold in 85 other countries as well. The second theme for us is about international prioritization. Um, four years ago, only 46% of our revenues came from outside the UK, so we were essentially a domestic media company. And we set ourselves the aim of becoming more international, got ourselves a target of getting 66% of our turnover from outside the UK by 2012, and we focused on a few key countries like Australia and India, where all parts of BBC Worldwide could expand. In 2009, the share of our revenue from outside the UK grew to 55%, and so we are now more international than we are domestic. But it's in the US where the majority of our focus now is as we continue that push towards two-thirds. The US is a market, as Marcel has alluded, five times larger than the next biggest country, and the USA exports and imports more TV than any other. We've been working hard to establish some credible scale there. Two TV channels, BBC America with 67 million subscribing homes, likely to touch 70 million soon. BBC World with 6 million homes. We export DVDs of British programs into the US. An example, uh, five and a half million copies of Planet Earth have been sold as DVD, which makes it the number one factual DVD of all time. In July, we launched a US version of BBC.com, and we set up a production arm on the West Coast with a wide development slate of scripted and non-scripted shows. And as a result, we're now turning over $450 million in the USA. But of course, key to this is great content. And in a crowded country like the USA, we're discovering that marketing it is equally important. So we tried a different approach recently with the launch of Doctor Who, the hit family drama. In April, we uh, agreed a launch date only two weeks after the UK transmission. OK, not simultaneous, but we're getting there. And uh, we secured the services of Matt Smith and Karen Gillan for interviews and for live events and so on created as much buzz as we could through social media. And this approach of sort of simultaneous relay and heavy marketing has produced excellent results. BBC America's biggest ever audience, the highest ever traffic to the website. It generated $2 million of media coverage in the US. And the collective audience of 4 million people for episode one, where we adopted the same technique in three countries simultaneously, equates in the UK to an audience share of 50%, so very lucrative indeed. The third area is digital. Every company has to have a digital strategy, of course, um, and even if it's just a stab in the dark. Four years ago, our total digital revenues were less than 1%, and from a range of new ventures, we're aiming to get that to 10% by 2012, and currently we're at 6%. My message here, though, is that without the luxury of a killer proposition like eBay for auctions, or Google for search, or Facebook for networking, what we've all got to do is try as many things as possible and hope that from wide experimentation, growth will come. Whether it's from ad-funded services like BBC.com, from licensing comedy clips to aggregators like YouTube, selling whole-length programs on iTunes or apps on the iPhones, every dollar counts. So far, BBC.com attracts 67 million unique users a month. We've made it into the top 10 in several iTunes charts in various countries. We've got channels on Facebook, MySpace, Google, and so on. We've downloaded 5 million Lonely Planet iPhone apps. And when the iPad came out, our ultimate travel experiences app reached number one in the chart. At the same time, BBC.com was number five. Our next launch will be an international version of the BBC iPlayer planned for next year. But despite all of this effort and very good growth rates, as Marcel said, non-digital, revenues are still in the, uh, non-digital is still dominant, with digital revenues very much in the minority, and that's likely to remain the case for us for the foreseeable future. Even if we hit our target of 10%, it still means that 90% are non-digital. So the final fourth area for us is about brand building. Um, we are increasingly learning that by directly knowing about what consumers want from having our own channels, our online and mobile businesses, from more marketing and so on, we're seeing the potential to turn pieces of intellectual property into multimedia global brands. 
properties like Dancing with the Stars, Doctor Who, Top Gear. They're not just TV programs. They've got potential as websites, physical products, clothes, toys, apps, digital games, and even live events. Doctor Who, the, the live tour, will kick off in London this weekend and will tour the UK for a month. Perhaps more remarkably, Walking with Dinosaurs Live saw a dozen life-size animatronic dinosaurs stalk arenas to the delight of adults and the horror of children, 4.4 million of them in fact, and after successful tours in Australia, the US and Europe, it's about to start doing the same thing in China. You can buy Top Gear as a Scalextric set, a Gran Turismo console game, a world-leading car magazine, a series of books, clothes, a DVD, and you can see it live. Top Gear Live uses the charismatic UK presenters and very exciting cars, and it's been seen now by 750,000 people in cities as diverse as Manchester and Hong Kong. Finally, Top Gear fans, let's just say, are an enthusiastic bunch. They want that brand in any way they can get it. If the Top Gear Facebook page were a country, right now it would be bigger than New Zealand. And if it continues growing at the same rate every month, it'll be bigger than Australia by April 2013. A new fine fan signs up to that site every four and a half seconds. So there are our strategies for growth as well as building our, our TV content. And if I may just sum up, um, essentially these four things are our roadmap to drive through the twin perils of recession and the digital revolution. But as always on any journey, it's the content that's in the driving seat. But the vehicle increasingly has got to be technologically savvy and the vehicle itself has got to be a brand that people are actually prepared to pay for. Thank you very much. John, thank you very much. Please join me. <coughs> Excellent as usual. Please. Um, John, there's a lot we could pick up on there, but um, I'll, I'll start off relatively uh, with an easy one for you. Yeah, I like the way you describe the fact that everyone has to have a digital strategy, even if it's just a stab in the dark. And I'm sure you, it's a lot more than that. Um, but you know, if you look at the, the sort of the growth that you have achieved and that you would like to achieve, what do you think are the biggest challenges around monetization of digital content? Well, it's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of challenges in there. I mean, you could list the whole problem of free versus pay yeah. as something which people will no doubt produce doctorates on in due course, and we're all watching how News International do with incredible care. You might also list in the issues with digital the difference between analog dollars and digital cents. You know, it's one thing uh, replacing an analog service with a digital one, but if all you're going to get is a few cents, it's uh, not necessarily the right thing to do. Patently, cannibalization is a problem. Then there's the business in the world of VOD of potentially undermining your own linear channels. That's a problem. Then there's piracy, etc. So there's plenty of things. And so we certainly feel we've tried a lot of different ideas out. Not everyone has been a runaway success. Some of them have got kicked at the starting gate. We had a service called Kangaroo, which was a commercial download service in the UK, which was blocked by the competition commission as being anti-competitive, so that didn't even get out of the gates. <laughs> Others have been more successful, but as I've already said, I mean, even despite everything we've now been doing for five or six years, we are in a place where only 6% of our total turnover is coming from online and mobile, and we think we're doing all right. You know, you, you mentioned also the, the fact that experimentation, and I use the word experimentation as well, was critical. Within the context of the BBC, how easy is it to experiment? Well, I mean, we, we, BBC Worldwide is a separate company to the BBC. Yeah, it yeah. owns the shares and shares the brand. But um, any programme we buy from the BBC is bought at arm's length. Uh, the two companies are run entirely separately. And so um, our decision-making is independent of the BBC's own decision-making. So I think if what you're implying is, is it impossible because we were owned by the BBC, the answer is definitely not. Right. The issues are not to do with that. They're to do with just the marketplace and how difficult yeah. it is to make en enormous amounts of money in this space. Wouldn't we all like to be Mark Zuckerberg? We, we would. Um, charming chap that he is. Um, if, we, if we look at the, um, the vision that you described, which I thought was really very compelling, but you know, if you had to list out the three or four major barriers to you achieving that vision, what would they be? Well, we have a particular problem which doesn't bother some of our competitors, which is lack of access to capital. And, uh, At the moment. <laughs> I suppose one of, the, one of the downsides of being owned by a public corporation in the UK who themselves are restricted in the amount of debt they can take on for obvious reasons, you've only got to look at the British economy, 
um, is that because uh, anything we borrow accounts on their balance sheet as though it's government borrowing, rather oddly, it means that um, we're restricted in the amount of capital that we've got access to, and uh, that's a very difficult thing when we're trying to compete against the world's biggest media companies. Uh, all our main competitors are American, based in America, massive scale on their side, great companies doing brilliant jobs, but hugely capitalized compared to us, and yet we're having to compete head-to-head -head on every front mm. with them. That's probably the single biggest problem we find, to be honest. Okay, I won't ask you when you're going for IPO. Let's move on a little bit. Let's look at geographies. You mentioned your objective, your vision, to have 66% by 2012. Yeah outside of the UK. Uh, you mentioned the importance of the US, I can get that. Um, where else in the world do you see that growth coming from? Well, again, there may be sort of unusual characteristics that are relevant for BBC Worldwide that may not be for, let's say, a European company. But for us, being an English language company first and foremost, when we looked at the world five years ago to work out where we'd put our focus, our first priority, we decided, we're English language countries because there is a sort of cultural affinity with our kind of programming. We don't have translation problems and so on. And indeed, English language countries where the regulatory environment is relatively benign seem like the highest opportunity for us. So early on, we prioritized Australia, India, the USA, and Canada as being right up there along with the UK, yeah. being our, our main areas of focus. And my plan was that the, the most important countries, those, we would try and get every part of BBC Worldwide to expand in every single one of those countries. And with some success, we've done all right. If you take Australia as an example, doubled our market share, and each part of the company has a reasonably significant business in Australia. Sort of the same is true in India and so on. Mm. But as I've already said, America is where we're focusing now, just because it's so important, the value is so great. And despite everything which we're doing there, and we think we're doing okay, we account for 0.24% of the US media market. So if we could double that, if we could quadruple it, we'd still only be 1%. Right. And yet at that point, we'd be turning over more than $2 billion. It would be a very significant thing for us. So that's why all our focus is there. Yeah. It's in, when you look at an expansion strategy, obviously you can have geographic, but you can also have key content brands. And mm. you have a great band in BBC, but you also have mm. some very compelling content brands. Um, you've mentioned Top Gear. Um, you've mentioned some formats. Is there anything else on you know, the sub-brand side, the content brand side that you see yeah. as critical? Well, we're working on a few, as you might expect. I mean, Top Gear, Doctor Who, Dancing with the Stars, Lonely Planet, they're already up there. Right. Um, but it's, um, it's my belief that it, after five years, half the company will probably be accounted for by maybe 10 key program brands in terms of turnover. Mm -hmm. And what we've discovered with something like Top Gear, which is probably the one we're most successful with, is if you really, really focus on it and apply traditional brand management techniques to, the, to something which is basically a piece of television content, it's incredible how successful you can be in all these different media formats in countries all over the world. And as I've said, consumers want more and more and more of it. And the more you give, the more they want. And so it's a fantastically good thing to do. We'd like to do the same thing with another nine or ten. And so we've, we've got some that are sort of getting there, like Doctor Who, and there are others that are bubbling away in the pipeline. Maybe now isn't the place to reveal which ones okay. we're working most on. When we look at, um, I guess, based on where I come from, it wouldn't, wouldn't be appropriate for me to not talk about China. Um, China, we didn't show the numbers, but obviously still very, very difficult for international media companies to access, mm. um, but nevertheless a huge market opportunity. Mm. How are you approaching that market? Yeah, China, we found China harder than other places. I mean, it's patently massively important every which way you look at it, and it's a brilliant country. Anybody who's ever been there, it is a wonderful place, and a very rich media experience you get in China. It's quite hard for a company like ours. For a start, there is the language barrier, which does, doesn't help. But other things, the ownership rules are different, and um, there are restrictions about brand building and so on, which make it a little harder. Mm -hmm. We find that in the world of DVDs, for example, we do sell a lot of DVDs in China, but the, the piracy issue there is harder than it is in some other places. And so we find increasingly, for us in China at least, we need to do business through, part, through local partners, often really great companies, but it's just harder. And because the, the cultural affinity is different, and because the language is different, we've sort of decided that we're going to put more focus into the, into the English language countries. But China will always remain an important place. I mean, we have, for example, Teletubbies, the number one preschool children's brand there. We've even got shopping centers, which are Teletubby right. branded shopping centers. You know, there's lots going on there, but all in partnership with, with local, local partners in China. 
And after all, there will be arguably more English speakers in China in a few years than there is anywhere else yes, in the world. Yes, and therefore um, English language teaching is a really big thing for any English uh, language teacher. China is a great market. Yeah. Um, John, when I uh, was giving my presentation, I put up sort of seven what I think are kind of critical uh, imperatives for, for companies in the sector to look at. Yeah. You saw that. How does that resonate with the BBC? Well, I, I mean, this is an honest statement. When I read your um, thing, which you kindly gave me over the weekend, uh, I couldn't believe how amazingly resonant every single one of those seven things are. I'm not just saying that because you're a nice bloke, although you Thank are. You. Uh, really did resonate. Um, but things like the, the need for flexibility and the need to experiment and be willing to take risks, some will work, some won't, that strikes me as really very fundamental. Again, unless you happen to have the killer app, like right. the Ebays of this world, which we don't have. That, that flexibility and experimentation is critical. And I think the other one I would highlight is the whole area of being able to cross-promote one thing with another, because we find, to go back to Top Gear for a moment, things like having Top Gear clips on Facebook or, or MySpace or on YouTube uh, allows cross-promotion to the topgear.com website and then allows you to promote Gran Turismo 5 and so on. And the more you can do that cross-promotion, the more you can make money and the more you can... Uh, build people's interest in wanting to get even more products from you. So I think those things would be the things. Mm. But all seven, to be honest, I agree completely with. On the partnering one in particular around expand, I mean, I guess cross-platform is part of that partnering. Um, but the point around just enriching the consumer experience, are you seeing any interesting sort of different types of partners out there that you're considering? Yeah, and as you are sort of saying, really, I think for any of us operating in this space, potentially anybody can be yeah. a partner in any country on any topic. And even... Companies that you might see as an enemy in one country or in one particular business can be your best friend in another. Yeah. And frankly, there's nothing wrong with that. That's just the way it works. On the talent side, um, obviously we're talking here, obviously a lot of content people here. Um, as, you, as you think about content, you've talked about formats. The content of tomorrow in terms of how we make that content and how we you know, uh, establish, develop that content, are you seeing any major sort of trends in that respect? Talent-wise? Um, well, I think uh, in our experience, the talent we work with, and we work with a lot, we've got a lot of people here today over the next two days as well. We've got uh, Stephen Fry and Matt Lucas and David Walliams and other people will be down joining us at MIPCOM. This is a very important showcase for them as well. They're making great programs. They want to promote them. You know, mm. they're, they're coming for obvious reasons. Increasingly, I find that they are very, very savvy at understanding the power of their brand and knowing how to cross-promote and market that brand through Twitter, I mean, Stephen can and does write and speak about the importance of Twittering to promote things and to engage with customers. I mean, he's absolutely brilliant at it, yeah. better than I could ever be. Um, so you find that you're, you're engaging with talent in ways that they're ahead of you in terms of understanding the importance of how the digital technologies work. That's something we weren't expecting. You on Twitter? I'm not, no. I'm frightened of what people might make of it. <laughs> I'm sure you have lots of followers, John. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, um, three. Yeah. <laughs> what about your wife? Your Exactly. Yeah, all right. Um, let's not go there. Um, well, unfortunately, we're actually running short of time. We could have extended this conversation, I think, for a lot longer. Um, your insights, I think, have been incredible. Good luck uh, in the, uh, the chase of your vision. Let's hope those barriers and that capital comes your way, John. Thank you, Marcel. Please join me in thanking Thank John Smith. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, at that point, let me thank you all for, for joining us uh, this keynote session. Um, have a great MIPCOM. It was great that we ended up talking about talent because that's what it's all about. So thank you very much indeed for coming.